Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Eric Palmer. I'm one of the elders here and also the director of missions. Um, before we get into God's word, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, just, we thank you for another year. We thank you for um, just the opportunity to gather here to worship you every Sunday, Lord. And uh, we just pray that you uh, would bless the reading of your word. It's in your name we pray. Amen. It is a privilege to gather here today to delve into the depths of God's word and explore the profound truth of Christ alone. It's the foundation of our faith. In a world filled with ideologies and beliefs, it's essential for us to anchor ourselves firmly in the unchanging truth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's one of my most favorite songs that we just sung in Christ alone. One of the main points of doctrine that came out of the Reformation is solus Christus, or Christ alone. We've often heard that it's not Jesus and that saves us, but it is Christ alone. The opening line of the song, In Christ Alone, is this, In Christ alone, my hope is found. But what does that really mean? Let's, let's talk about what hope is first. The dictionary defines hope as expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. Positive psychologist Charles Snyder defines hope as a positive cognitive state based on a sense of successful goal-directed determination and planning to meet these goals. There's the four pillars of hope. Healthy living. After all, our bodies are a temple to the Lord. Financial security. Everything belongs to God, and we must be good stewards of it. Educational success, which can be down, watered down to wisdom from God, and of course, strong families. But what does the Bible say? The Bible defines hope as the confident expectation of what God has promised, which is rescue and restoration, and its strength is in his faithfulness. So what do we put our hope in? We often hope for financial gain, a job advancement, a bigger house, a nicer car. We can hope that the number of friends we have increases or that we be given earthly accomplishments or awards. We can hope that our, God, our good deeds are noticed, that we can hope that the success of organizations or ministries we're involved in is attained to us. Or we can hope that the verses we memorize, the Bible studies we lead or are, are involved in, or how many mission trips we've been on, provide a good feeling in us. But none of these provide the everlasting hope that Christ alone brings. Psalm 62, 1 through 2 and 5 through 6 says this, For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. For God alone... Oh, my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. So let's explore what Christ alone means for us today. I first want to talk about the exclusivity of Christ. So if you turn with me to Acts 4, chapter 12. <clears throat> Acts 4, chapter 12. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men for which we must be saved. This foundational principle emphasizes that salvation is found exclusively through Christ Jesus and that he is the only way to God. While this idea might be challenging for some to accept in a world that values inclusivity and a diversity of beliefs, it's important to explore why this exclusivity is a crucial aspect of the Christian faith. Let's look at why this is. The first is the claims of Christ. If you'll turn with now back with me to the book of John, chapter 14. John 14, verses 1 through 6.
Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may also go. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So at the end of chapter 13 in John, Jesus has just given his disciples some disturbing news, a.k.a. Judas' betrayal and Peter's denial. In verse 1 of chapter 14, they're asked to trust in God, to believe in him. Jesus was speaking to Thomas, who did not understand what he was saying. Jesus' own words emphasize his exclusive role in salvation. In verse 6, he declares, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This statement is direct and unambiguous, highlighting that the path to God is is through him and him alone. This claim isn't just a casual assertion. It's a profound declaration of his identity as the Son of God and the only means to reconciliation with our Father. Jesus is not one way among many, but he is the way. He is the way to the Father. John uses the word truth 25 times, and most of the time it's linked directly to Jesus. So follow Jesus. He will lead the way. This bold claim highlights the exclusivity of Christ's role in our salvation. But there's a countercultural message out there. And a culture that emphasizes inclusivity and pluralism, which, for those of you who don't know what that is, I had to look it up, uh, it's a political philosophy that is the recognition and affirmation of diversity within a political body, which is seen to permit the peaceful coexistence of different interests, convictions, and lifestyles. So we have a culture that emphasizes that inclusivity and that pluralism. However, the notion of Christ alone can be challenging to accept in this world. In a world that emphasizes tolerance, the concept of Christ exclusivity can be met with resistance. Let's talk about some of that resistance. So turn with me to 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. 1 Timothy 2, 5. It's one of those tiny books that are towards the back of the Bible. 1 Timothy 2, 5. It says, For there is one God and there is one mediator, between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. This is the basic belief of Judaism, which every Jew confesses daily in their Shema. Shema is the Hebrew for here. So Paul is writing to Timothy, who is in Ephesus. The Ephesian church had a heresy problem. It combined Gnosticism, decadent Judaism, and false asceticism. So let's break that down a little bit further. Gnosticism teaches that the spirit is good, but all matter is bad, including the body. So the body was to be treated harshly, and breaking God's law had no consequences. There's only salvation by special knowledge. doesn't work. Uh, decadent Judaism. Jews were being decadent and using their positions of religious leadership for personal gain. You can read more about that in, in 1 Timothy 1. And then false asceticism is a severe self-discipline and avoidance of all forms of indulgence. So as Timothy was leading this church in Ephesus, he met a lot of resistance. And so when we are met with that resistance, it's crucial that we distinguish between two important points. It's exclusivity of Christ, not exclusion. The, exclu the exclusivity of Christ's role in salvation does not mean that we are called to exclude or condemn those who hold different beliefs. The exclusivity of Christ is not about exclusion, but about the unique and irreplaceable role 
that he plays in bridging the gap between humanity and God. It's a message of hope and love, inviting everyone to enter into a relationship with God through faith in Christ. Second point we have to be aware of is the reality of truth. In an age of relativism where truth is often viewed as subjective, the exclusivity of Christ stands as an unwavering assertion of absolute truth. Christ claims, Christ's claim challenges the idea that all paths lead to God, asserting that there is one ultimate truth that is embodied in Jesus. Then there's the necessity of the cross. The exclusivity of Christ is intricately tied to his sacrificial death on the cross. So please turn with me to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verses 23 through 25. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. The Apostle Paul explains here that all have fallen short and all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that in Christ Jesus. This redemption is was achieved through Christ's death and resurrection. And it is this act alone that reconciles us to God. There's a global impact here. While the exclusivity of Christ may seem narrow in focus, its implications are universal. The message of Christ's salvation is meant for all people, transcending cultural, ethnic, and social boundaries. Jesus' commission to his disciples in Matthew 28 calls them to go and make disciples of all nations, sharing in the good news of salvation found only in him. So we have a freedom here to choose. God's design provides us with the freedom to choose. The exclusivity of Christ respects our capacity for choice. It invites us to respond to his invitation willingly, It's an invitation to accept his gift of salvation, grounded in the truth of who he is and what he has done. So we see that the exclusivity of Christ is a central tenet of the Christian faith that underscores the uniqueness of his role as the savior of the path to God. It's a truth that's both challenging and transformative, emphasizing the need for a personal relationship with Jesus as the way to eternal life. As followers of Christ, we're called to embrace and share this truth with love, humility, and a deep sense of conviction, recognizing that Christ alone offers the hope and reconciliation that our world desperately needs. Next, I want to focus on on the sufficiency of Christ. (coughs) Sorry, I'm trying to get over this cold here. Uh, the, the principle emphasizes that in Christ alone we find all that we need for our spiritual life, growth, and fulfillment. So let's look at eight ways that Christ fulfills all of our needs. First one is worldly pursuits versus Christ's sufficiency. Christ's sufficiency liberates us. It frees us from worldly pursuits. We talked about what we put our hope in. We don't need to put our hope in that stuff. Christ has taken care of it. The sufficiency of Christ stands as a stark contrast to the world's constant pursuit and promotion of materialism, success, and self-sufficiency. In a culture that often tells us our value is determined by our achievements, 
our experiences, or our possessions, the sufficiency of Christ reminds us that true contentment and fulfillment comes from our relationship with him. <clears throat> Colossians 2.10 states, In Christ you have been brought to fullness. Not partway. Fullness. And fullness does not come from our job title, the size or look of our house, the kind of car we drive, the clothes we wear, but in Christ alone. <clears throat> Christ alone is sufficient to meet our deepest needs and provide eternal satisfaction. We also have freedom now from legalism. Legalism is the belief that we can earn favor with God through strict adherence to religious practices and rules and rituals. Christ's sufficiency, sufficiency sets us free. Thank you, Dennis. Christ's sufficiency sets us free from this burden. We no longer need to strive to earn God's love or approval through our own efforts. Instead, we can rest in the finished work of Christ. Galatians 5.1 declares, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Christ's sufficiency frees us from the burden of legalistic religiosity. We don't need to earn God's favor through rituals, our acceptance comes through Christ. <clears throat> Next, we have the empowerment for living. Christ's presence and Holy Spirit empower us to live victoriously, demonstrating his love and grace. Our identity and purpose find fulfillment in Christ alone, enabling us to serve others with genuine love. The sufficiency of Christ doesn't leave us stagnant. It empowers us to live out our faith in practical ways. <clears throat> Through the indwelling Holy Spirit, Christ equips us with the strength, wisdom, and guidance we need to navigate life's complexities. But to gain that strength, wisdom, and guidance, we need to turn to the scriptures and study them over and over again. Identity and purpose. The sufficiency of Christ shapes that for us, shapes our identity and our purpose. Our worth is not defined by what we do, but who we are in Christ. In him, we are children of God, dearly loved and accepted. This transforms how we view ourselves and how we approach life's challenges. Ephesians 2.10 reminds us that we are God's handiwork created in Christ to do good works which God has prepared in advance for us. God has made us. He's given us that purpose to do the work that he has laid out before us. Next, we have gratitude and contentment. Recognizing Christ's sufficiency cultivates gratitude and contentment. When we realize that all we have is a gift from him, we're less likely, likely to be consumed <clears throat> by envy, by comparison, by discontent. We learn to trust God's provision, knowing that he cares for us. The sufficiency of Christ also extends into our relationships as well. He is the model of love and forgiveness, teaching us how to love others selflessly. In Christ, we find the power to mend broken relationships, extend grace, and live in harmony with one another. Life is filled with challenges, but Christ's sufficiency offers hope in the midst of difficulties. When we encounter trials, we can turn to him for strength, comfort, and peace. 2 Corinthians 12.9 reminds us that my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And lastly, the sufficiency of Christ ensures our eternal security. When we trust in him, we have the assurance of salvation and a place in God's eternal kingdom. <clears throat> Romans 8, 38-39 reassures us that nothing, nothing can separate, separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So the sufficiency of Christ is a life transforming truth that speaks to the core of our existence. 
In him, we find freedom from worldly pursuits, liberation from legalism. We find purpose, empowerment, and fulfillment of our deepest needs. As we embrace Christ's sufficiency, we can live with confidence, contentment, and a heart overflowing with gratitude for all that he has done and continues to do for us. Now, let's talk about what that means for us in our own salvation. Look at eight ways that Christ alone connects to our own personal salvation. The first way is the problem of sin. <clears throat> sin is a universal, re universal reality that separates humanity from God's perfect holiness. The Bible affirms in what we just read in Romans 3 that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin is not just a matter of of individual wrongdoings. It's a deep-seated brokenness that affects every one of us. It affects every aspect of our lives. It affects our relationship with God. Our efforts, our good works, or religious practices can't bridge this gap. So what is the solution? Christ alone. This concept of Christ alone highlights the central role that Christ Jesus plays in reconciling humanity with God, and securing our eternal destiny. Through his life, his death, and his resurrection, Christ offered himself as the perfect sacrifice to atone for our sins. He was the only perfect sacrifice. Christ alone was the only one who could atone for our sins. <clears throat> Throughout history, humans have attempted to bridge the gap between themselves and God through various means, good deeds, religious rituals, moral living, and more. However, Scripture is clear that our efforts, no matter how noble, cannot erase the stain or the sin to earn us a place in God's presence. Ephesians 2, 8-9 through 9 reminds us that salvation is not by works so that no one can boast. Yeah, it's good to be a good person, but it's not good enough. Only through faith in Christ's finished work that we can be reconciled with God. Grace alone, another point that came out of the Reformation. Salvation is not earned, but received as a gift of God's grace. This underscores our utter dependence on Christ's redemptive work. Christ alone reminds us that our salvation is a gift of God's grace. Grace is unmerited favor. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. Uh, Titus 3.5, we're reminded that we are saved, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. In response to the problem of sin, God provided the ultimate solution in Christ Jesus. The heart of Christ alone as our salvation rests in his sacrificial atonement. In Romans 5.8, we read, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I'll read that again. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ didn't wait till we were perfect. He died for us while we were still sinners. His death on the cross was not only an act of unparalleled love, but also a substitutionary sacrifice that paid the penalty on behalf of on our behalf. The significance of Christ alone as our salvation extends beyond the cross to the resurrection. In conquering death, Christ demonstrated his power over sin, over death, over the grave. Through his resurrection, he offers us new life and the assurance of eternal life. As the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Faith is the key. We have a part to play. We cannot ignore that. While Christ's sacrifice is sufficient for all, we have to respond to God's grace with faith. Faith is the key that unlocks the door to salvation. Romans 10.9 states, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
the beauty of Christ alone as our salvation extends to all people. It's not limited by race, nationality, social status, or even past mistakes. It's available to anyone who believes and trusts in him. Embracing Christ alone as our salvation transforms our identity. We become children of God, co-heirs with Christ, and partakers of his divine nature. Our identity is no longer defined by our past, but our new life in Christ. Christ alone as our salvation encapsulates the depth of God's love, the power of Christ's sacrifice, and the transformative power of his resurrection. It underscores our need for a Savior, the sufficiency of his work, and the invitation to a personal relationship with him. Let us hold fast to this truth, living in the freedom and hope that Christ alone offers. As we conclude... We know that Christ alone is the cornerstone of our faith, the foundation upon which we build our lives. In a world of shifting values and uncertain paths, we can stand firm, knowing that our hope and salvation are secure in Christ Jesus. Let us hold fast to this truth, proclaim it boldly, and live it out daily, trusting in the sufficiency of Christ for every aspect of our life. Where do you find hope? Where do you place your faith? Is it in Christ alone? If not, ask God to show you how to put your hope and faith in him and him alone. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, as we go from this place, let's remember that our lives are a testament to your transforming power. May our actions, our words, our attitudes reflect the truth that Christ alone is our Savior, our Lord, and our greatest treasure. Amen.